Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord, the place we call Bethesda. We're glad each and every one of you are here. Uh, great to see everybody here on this Father's Day. Hope that you will be blessed. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious giving God, we come into your house and we give thanks. We give thanks that you are our Father and you will always be our Father. We give thanks for the fathers who are here. We give thanks for the fathers who have come and gone. And we just ask that you would just touch each and every heart and let us feel the, your love and your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 18, 1 through 15. And this is the three visitors who visit, visited Abraham. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great tree of Mari while he was sitting in the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw the three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and he bowed down low to them to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water, <clears throat> let a little water be brought, and then you shall wash your feet and rest under the tree. Let me get you something to eat, and you can be refreshed, and then go on your way. Now that you have come to your servant, very well. They answered, "Do as you say." So Abraham hurried to the, the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said. Get three measures of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf. He gave it to the servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set them before them. While they ate, he stood them under a tree. Where's your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about the time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening in the entrance to the tent, which is behind him. Abraham and Sarah were greatly old and well advanced in their years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, I am worn out, and my master is old. Will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I'm old? I will return to you. Excuse me. It is too hard for the Lord. I will return to you at an appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh, but he said, yes, you did laugh. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. How many of you have your Bibles with you today? Let me see. Hold them high. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Looks good to see all them Bibles go up. This morning, I'm going to be reading from Eugene Peterson's The Message simply because I wanted us to, to hear his words uh, because they're, they're words that I think we need to hear in our own translation, words that we use each and every day as we listen to what Jesus is telling us. Uh, this, this scripture passage that I'm going to read for us is taken from Matthew chapter 9 and chapter 10, beginning with verse 35, chapter 9, verse 35, all the way through 10, 23. And <clears throat> I think if we listen to Eugene Peterson's words that are given to us so that we can have a better understanding exactly of what Jesus is telling us will help us better understand. This, uh, this particular passage is taken before Jesus really uh, started His ministry up. It was, it was just right when He was beginning uh, he had not even called his disciples by name yet. He had not named his twelve. So uh, this is a passage where he names the twelve 
So it gives you an idea of, of where he's at in his ministry, just getting started. So uh, if you would, just listen to the words uh, as I read them from, uh, from Eugene Peterson's the message, beginning with verse 35, chapter 9. Then Jesus made a circuit of all the towns and villages. He taught in their meeting places, reported kingdom news, and healed their diseased bodies, healed their bruised and hurt lives. When he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. What a huge harvest, he said to his disciples. How few workers. On your knees and pray for harvest hands. The prayer was no sooner prayed than it was answered. Jesus called twelve of his followers and sent them into the ripe fields. He gave them power to kick out the evil spirits and to tenderly care for the bruised and hurt lives. This is the list of the twelve he sent. Simon, they called him Peter or Rock. Andrew, his brother. James, Zebedee's son. John, his brother. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas. Matthew, the tax man. James, son of Alphaeus. Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite. And Judas Iscariot, who later turned on him. Jesus sent his twelve harvest hands out with this charge. Don't begin by traveling to some far off place to convert unbelievers. And don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Raise the dead. Touch the untouchables. Kick out the demons. You have been treated generously, so live generously. Don't think you have to put on a fundraising campaign before you start. You don't need a lot of equipment. You are the equipment. And all you need to keep that going is three meals a day. Travel light. When you enter a town or a village, don't insist on staying in a luxury hotel. Get a modest place with some modest people and be content there until you leave. When you knock on a door, be courteous in your greeting. If they welcome you, be gentle in your conversations. If they don't welcome you, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. You can be sure that on Judgment Day, they'll be mighty sorry, but it's no concern of yours now. Stay alert. This is hazardous work I'm assigning you. You're going to be like sheep running through a pack of wolves. So don't call attention to yourselves. Be as cunning as a snake, inoffensive as a dove. Don't be naive. Some people will impugn your motives. Others will smear your reputation just because you believe in me. Don't be upset when they haul you before the civil, civil authorities. Without knowing it, they've done you and me a favor, given us a platform for preaching the kingdom news. And don't worry about what you'll say or how you'll say it. The right words will be there. The Spirit of your Father will supply the words. When people realize it is the living God you are presenting and not some idol that makes them feel good, they are going to turn on you, even people in your own family. There is a great irony here, proclaiming so much love and experiencing so much hate. But don't quit. Don't cave in. It is all well worth it in the end. It is not success that you are after in such times, but survival. Be survivors. Before you run out of options, the Son of Man will have arrived. May God bless the reading and the hearing and the understanding of this, His holy word, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> well, over the last several weeks, since we've had those puppies, I have been trying my best to keep up with them. But they have wanted to run all over the neighborhood. 
And I've been out there with a walker and with a cane and holding on to Susie's wheelchair and, and trying to round them up as often as I could. They won't stay on a leash. You put them on a leash and they just lay down. But if you turn them loose, they, they like to run and play. And I love to watch them run and play. And most of the time they'll stay in the yard, but they like to run off. We have invisible fencing, but they wouldn't do the training and put the collars on them <clears throat> until they were 16 weeks old because they said they were too young uh, to have that kind of shock. So finally, a couple weeks ago, 16 weeks came, and not none too soon. But they, they came out and they, they turned the juice on and they put the collars on them and they done the training. They've done two days of training. And now the puppies are free to roam within their own safety zone, and I am so relieved. But uh, we would be out there, Susie and I, trying to find the puppies, would call and call. We didn't know where they'd gone to. We didn't know whether they went to the woods behind the house or whether they'd gone to the neighbors to the left or to the right. Or We even found them across the street, two or three doors down at the neighbor's home. So they were just, they were everywhere. You could turn your, your, your eyes off of for just a moment, and they were gone. It was like magic. They just disappeared. But uh, the neighbors saw us sometimes out there struggling, me holding on to the wheelchair or walking with a cane or whatever and, and, and struggling to find them. They'd come out and help us, and uh, they'd find the puppies. But, you know, as I, as I found those puppies, I wanted to beat them, you know, after running off. <coughs> Excuse me. But, you know, I would look at those little puppies, and, and I would have compassion on them. I would love them because they're just being puppies. They're just doing what puppies do. They didn't know that they were putting themselves in danger, crossing the road and running off in the woods and possibly getting snake bit again. So, uh, but uh, I would have compassion on them. And so as I read this passage of Scripture, I began to see what just a, a small glimpse of what Jesus felt for the crowds that He was able to see. He had compassion for them. And you know, Jesus still has compassion for us today. And thank God that He does. You know, He sees us, not just His people, but all people, as sheep without a shepherd, or as a puppy without a, without a, without a mama. But, you know, thank God that He has that great compassion for us. And He saw that there was so much work to be done, He couldn't do it all. Even the Son of God could not do it all. So He began to call His disciples to come in and help Him with the work that needed to be done. He said the fields are ripe to be harvested. There's so much work to be done. And you know, there's more work now than there was in Jesus' day. When you look out across the fields, when you look out across the highways and the byways, you look at all the cities and towns, there's so many people out here that don't know God, that don't have the love of God living in their hearts. There's so many people that just don't have time for God. They're too busy in their own little world. And so the world is ripe for harvest. And Jesus is calling us the same way He called His disciples to come and do the work. And you know, there's an interesting thing <clears throat> excuse me, about these 12 disciples that He called. We always think of the 12 disciples as kind of being in their own little group. But you know, there was a big variety of people just in the 12 disciples. There was fishermen, there was farmers, there was tax collectors, there were zealots, people who were so, uh, so much against the Roman Empire that they would do everything in their power to, to try to stamp out the Roman Empire. So you had a, a big variety of of people that had different thoughts and ideas about how things need to be done. But Jesus brought them together for the common purpose of doing the work of the kingdom. To tell people about the kingdom of heaven. To tell them how to love one another. And He's still doing that today. So many of us are so different in the way we perceive things. There's Republicans, there's Democrats, Right here among us, there's liberals, there's conservatives, and there's everything in between. We all have different thoughts and ideas about the way we need to do things. But Christ brings us together in unity. 
The same way He brought those twelve disciples together. And He taught them and He told them what they need to do. And it's really quite simple. He said, you've got everything you need. You don't need to go out here and raise a bunch of money. You don't need to have a fundraiser. You don't need all this education. You know, so many times that's what I hear from people. Well, I don't have the education. I don't have the background. I don't have this. I don't have that. I'm too old. I'm too young. We hear excuses upon excuses. Jesus told us very plainly in His Word, we don't need all this stuff. We've got everything that we need. He's already given it to us. He's told us to be generous because we have received generosity from the Father. We all have a story to tell. Every single one of us has been brought to Christ by different means. We've been brought to know the love of God in a different way. And people want to hear that. Not everybody. There's some people who will tell you right quick, they don't have time to hear your stories. And you know what? That's okay. Because what did He tell us in His Word? He says if, we, if they don't welcome us, move on. In some translations it says, knock the dust off of your feet and move on to the next town. You see, I think a lot of times we, as God's people, we take it on ourselves that we've got to get everybody saved. We've got to go out here and do all this stuff and, and we're not going to give up until they are saved. Well, that's not what Jesus is teaching us. He's teaching us that we just need to share God's love with other people. The ones that want to hear it. The rest of them we don't have to worry about. Just move on to the next people. I think we get too wrapped up in what we want to do. What we want to say. There's a lot of people who want to do the work of the church, but yet they're not willing to go out here and do the work of God. And share His Gospel. Share the good news of Jesus Christ. To simply tell your stories. To tell what Jesus Christ has done. You know, a lot of times it's not necessarily always telling our stories, but it's listening to other people. Just listening to what they have to say. You know, that's one of the things that Kim Shockley taught us in those classes that she had for us. Listening is a very important part of sharing God's love. Because there's so many people that don't have time to hear your story or hear someone else's story. They want us to simply just listen to what they have to say. That is part. And we, part of what God wants us to do. And we can all listen. We can all listen to what God or listen to what other people want to tell us about their lives, the problems that they're having. Be a good listener. But He tells us to shake the dust off of our feet, and move on. He says that the ones that are left, that's, God for, that's God's job to worry about them. We don't have to worry about them anymore. We've done our job when we presented the gospel. And then if they don't want to hear it, fine. Move on to the next person. You know, talking about shaking the dust off of your feet makes me wonder, well, what really is dust? Have you ever thought about dust very much? Have you thought about what dust really is? There's plenty of it in my house if you come and, 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 and do the cleaning. But dust is simply dead skin. It's part of uh, the ground on the dirt. That creates dust. When you cut grass, you, you, you have a lot of dust. It flies everywhere. But the Bible tells us a little bit about dust, doesn't it? It says that we were created from dust and that God created man from the dust of the earth and breathed life into his, into his nostrils. It goes on to say that from dust you came and dust you shall return. So we are nothing really but dust. So when he's telling us to knock the dust off of our feet and move on, we need to think a little bit about what dust really is. You know, I read a story this past week <clears throat> about a guy when he started his ministry. His name is, uh, is Sam Wells. Some of you may recognize that name. Sam Wells was the dean of the chapel at Duke University uh, for about five or six years. When I took my preaching courses at Duke, 
Uh, I listened to a lot of his sermons. It was, it was required li- reading and, and listening. We even saw some videos that were taped of Sam Wells and his preaching. He's, he's an excellent speaker. Uh, he's just fantastic uh, minister of the gospel. He can tell so many stories and, and really get your attention. And uh, I enjoyed listening to his sermons. But this, this particular story that, that I read uh, was a story when he took his first appointment. He was appointed to a little small church, and there was only 15 people in the church. We've got twice that many here today, I notice. But he only had 15 people, and he thought that he was going to set the world on fire. Uh, he had lots of big ideas and hopes and dreams. And one of the things that he wanted to do was he wanted to have a candlelight service on Christmas Eve. And he wanted to do it at midnight. Well, nobody really wanted to come to the church at midnight. But he was bound to determine he was going to have this service at midnight. So he planned the service and planned for it to start at 11.30 on Christmas Eve. So that, that evening came and he got to the church early and had everything set up, had his communion table set, and he sat there and waited. And 11 o'clock, nobody was there. 11.15, nobody was there. 11.25, nobody was there. 11.30, nobody was there. Not one person. Not one person. He began to sit there and, and think and wonder about, did he do the right thing? Was this really something he should do or, or was this just his own thoughts and ideas? And then at 11.32, the doors opened and in came two people. And as they came in, they asked, well, is all this just for us? He said, it sure is. Come on in and have a seat. And he began to talk with those people and he asked them, he said, well, why did you come here tonight? They said, well, we almost didn't come. said, we... We've been talking about it for for several weeks and we finally decided that if there wasn't many people there that that we would come. And so we've been in the parking lot for the last 30 minutes waiting to see how many people was going to show up. And when nobody showed up, we decided that this was a perfect opportunity for us to come. Because we used to be members at this church. We used to come to this church and we were active. But we we got divorced. We got divorced. And then the two of us got married again. This was two different families. And these two people got together and remarried. And we felt like that we wouldn't be welcomed back at the church. And so we haven't come for many years. But we decided that this was a good opportunity for us to come and see if we would be received very well. And so that night kind of broke the ice. And they rededicated their lives to Christ once again on that night. You see, that is part of knocking the dust off of your feet and leaving it up to God. Sometimes we can't do it all. Sometimes it has to be God's doing. We have to let God do His work. And that's what the people of that church had done. They had kind of knocked the dust off of their feet and ignored these people. But when the time was right, God called them back in. And they became active members of that church once again. Thanks be to God. So we need to learn from so many experiences that sometimes we just have to leave things alone and leave it up to God. Let God do His thing. And in the meantime, we need to share the ministry uh, or share the love of Christ with those that we come in contact with. Share God's love. That's what it's all about. That's what Jesus is teaching us in His Word is to share the love of Christ with one another. Share it with those who want to hear it, who are willing to listen to what we have to say and to all those others that reject us. Knock the dust off your feet and move on to the next ones. Thanks be to God for His love and for all that He has shown us God has been generous to us. Let us be generous to others. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving God, we come before you today thanking you for so many blessings that you have given to us. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the stories that you've shared with us. 
We thank you, O oh Lord, that you've reminded us once again how much you love us and how much you care for us. How you have equipped us to do your work. You have given us our own stories. Lord, may your Holy Spirit empower us this day. Give us the boldness and the courage and the strength to go forth and to share your great love. Oh Lord, we pray that today that we might be generous with other people. We might share all the many good things that you have given to us with others. And to Lord, those that, that don't have time, to those that reject our words, help us to not take it personally, but to move on to the next person and leave it up to you. Lord, we need to learn this valuable lesson that sometimes things are just better left to you and for your purpose. Oh Lord, empower us this day. Help us to know the difference. And let us be your servants. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.